Now, typically, one of the main measures or KPIs that people talk about is what's called a conversion rate. Um, so if this is, um, you know, 1,000 people that are visiting your online presence and um, let's say 1,000 people that are visiting your um, offline presence in a day, in a week, in a month, in a year, depending on the size of your business, there'll be a portion of those people that convert. Um, by convert, in this sense, we're just saying spend money with you. So for, for e-commerce, at best, we might be looking at um, 1% to 2%, depending on whether you're what's called a pure play market, whether you're someone who only sells online or whether you're someone that's, um, that sells in, in store and online as well. Um, so one, one or two percent, pretty small. You know, if you're an accountant, you'd say it's pretty close to around any era. It's not really worth it. Um, in store, I think the latest numbers talk anywhere between 15 to 40 percent. So you know, a much bigger chunk um, of people that will actually come in and, and spend money with you because of um, the experience that they have. So when you think about that, um, if, you're a, if you've got rents and staff, um, fit outs, power bills, the whole lot, the, the investment to make sure that you can serve a thousand people, um, it needs that at least, you know, let's say if it was 20%, that at least 20 people, um, 20%, 200 people, do my maths, um, 200 people are shopping and spending money and money's uh, coming out the bottom. Um, same with here in the website, we're hoping that um, the one or two percent of those, which will be you know, 10 to 20 people, um, are converting. Now, obviously, the thing about e-commerce versus online, you know, to serve a thousand people, your space needs to be a certain size, but for um, a website, you can, you can have orders of magnitude more people. Um, you can put 10,000 people on here quite easily without any real change and make that number a, a bigger number quite quickly. Um, that'll all come down to your marketing and advertising and the, and the, the, the amount of money you spend on people arriving at your sites. Um, footfall is the measure they use, visits for, for website. Um, so what we find though is that this, this weird thing happens where the part of the business that's in charge of online or digital, um, and even those terms I think can be really confusing. I mean, um, we used to have chief electrical officers hundreds of years ago when we were sort of bringing electricity into the business. Now we don't. Even the heads of IT now, or um, CTOs or CIOs, are becoming less about the person that makes all the technology work, but someone that actually creates opportunity. So the term digital, I think, you probably need to step away from it and realise that it's just anything that uses technology, which is probably everything. So whatever you are as a practitioner, then you know, digital is going to be part of your world. You don't necessarily have to be good at it, so you just need to be good at articulating what you want from it. There's plenty of practitioners or vendors or providers out there that understand the tech, they just don't understand your business. So your job is not to understand the tech so much, but to be very clear and intentional in, it, in describing what your business wants from the tech, specifically. Um, so anyway, back to this, I think what we find is that if I was in charge of online and I was trying to maximize this number here um, and the reason why, why would i even try to maximize this number i mean probably because these 10 sales which maybe equals a hundred dollars um, my entire e-commerce budget will be dependent on how well this performs so all of a sudden if i've got a thousand dollar budget or a ten thousand dollar budget or a hundred thousand dollar budget for my e-commerce it's probably directly linked to the money it can generate or the money we hope that it generates um, and the same will go for um, for stores, I know in retail, they, there's a term called um, sales per square meter. So if the sales per square meter of the store drops below a certain point, then that's it, the store gets shut um, because it, it's not seen as a viable store in its own right. Um, and this is where I think it's a bit of a short-sighted view on the role of online and in-store and multi-channel. Um, the more interesting question is, what are the 990 people doing? What are these people doing? Um, and also, what are these people doing? Now, we know what these people are doing. If you ask them when they're walking around, they'd say just browsing. Um, and there's a reason why I call this a web browser. They're probably just browsing here as well. Um, but just browsing is very valuable. I mean, when we go back to the um, advertising pixel example that we were talking about, Google or Facebook or whatever ad advertising pixel that's on here sees all of those. Google is making money from 1,000 visitors. You're making visit money from 10 visitors. The money that the Google's making out of this is everyone who's interested in host fittings or beds or women's dresses. 
Um, so now that they know that, they, they activate that money. Um, hopefully you're the one buying it, but other people are buying it too, like I said before. So I think the opportunity here is to understand the value of this, because even if the value of this um, is uh, one tenth of the value of a real sale, because you're trying to leverage this interaction um, information, then your budgets that you might set for online might be different. And the same happens for stores. Um, uh, what are people doing in here? If I walk um, out of my office here in the CBD of Melbourne and go to uh, Myers um, Homewares departments and look at some sort of big chunky items like a new coffee machine or a Dyson vacuum cleaner or something like that, there's a good chance I actually don't want to take it home. I want to look at it, I want to touch it and feel it and see how heavy it is and see whether it gets some measurements, but I'm not going to necessarily buy it. So I might go back and buy online. Um, and I might jump straight in there and be seen as a very active um, customer. We went to the website, went straight to the checkout and bought. So the e-commerce team will be going, look at us go, our e-commerce site's working really well. I mean, really the store should have got that. There's a new term being thrown around where that's where sales per, um, per experience as opposed to sales per square meter is what people are starting to talk about. Um, so if all of a sudden um, across this, we can start seeing that there is a portion of people, um, oh, before I go on to that, so like I said, everyone will spend all their time and money trying to make um, this group of people who are nearly about to convert, convert. It might be another half a percent. And in store, we've got all our sales teams focusing on this idea of just trying to make some of these people convert. Um, yet there's a whole group of people, I'll put them over this side, um, here, that are probably you know, pretty close to converting. They're, they're in a, a pretty decent stage. Um, but these people will probably be wanting to go into store to finish their, their conversion. And these people here are probably wanting to go online to finish their conversion. Making a, a small number of people convert here is really hard. It's called conversion rate optimization. Um, it's hard and it's expensive and there's a real law of diminishing returns. The more effort you go put into it, the you get a bit more return, but it's less and less over time. If you could understand what these people are doing, um, then you'd be in a much better position because there's a lot more of people uh, in these buckets. Um, there's another little um, sort of sequence that I'll draw up where, where the, in, in this value exchange, there's three steps. Um, there is discover, transact, um, and um, I'll, just, I'll just put deliver or um, take delivery. Um, so these are the three steps in a transaction. You know, I spend time discovering what, like, and researching and getting it down. I mean, we're assuming that we've already decided that you're the brand for me. So when it comes to discovery being, you know, are, are you a brand that even exists? We're really in, in digital advertising te territory, which is sort of outside of my experience. Um, but let's assume they've found you and they're on one of your properties, whether it be a physical property or a, um, a digital one. Um, they then transact, money changes hands. That's pretty easy, pretty obvious. And then delivery is that the goods go from your location to my location. Um, the, the thing is that often in you know, the old world, this all happened in one step. I would walk to the store, I would go to the POS, I would put the goods in a bag and walk out the door. What's happening now is that the order and the distance between these, these things are changing. I will, a really complex example would be, I'll go to the website and buy three t-shirts because I'm not sure what size I am. I'll get those t-shirts delivered to my house. I'll try them, I'll try them on, the two that don't fit me, I'll put into the returns bag and I'll send back to the store. Or maybe I'll walk it back to the store myself. And when I walk back into the store, I'll say, well, I'm returning these two things from my online order, but while I'm here, I'd also like to get those shorts. So, in, and then, so when did the transaction happen? Did it happen when I first placed the order for three t-shirts or did it happen when I finalized the payment by returning the two t-shirts and getting a pair of shorts in exchange? I'd argue that the transaction doesn't happen until that point or even take delivery. You've sort of merged all these concepts together. If I went to a store, took three t-shirts into the change room and gave two back, you wouldn't consider that a return. You just consider that part of the discovery phase. Um, so all of a sudden the role of online and in-store are a lot more symbiotic um, than what we probably give it credit for. So these all things sound obvious, um, and, but I think a lot of brands, especially if they've got separate online and in-store departments, will see that guy turning up to the store returning two shirts 
as just an annoying part of the day that sends my sales into negative territory as opposed to an opportunity to solve um, for this particular customer. Um, and vice versa, someone who spends all their time creating an interaction in store, trying three things on, saying to the person who's serving me, I hate red, I love this blue color, but I'm not buying anything today. If I walk out the store and there is no record of what's just happened, then that's a huge waste of opportunity. If none of this information of what's happening in this component where the discovery was happening, if none of that's recorded for my benefit, then what was the point? What was the point of going into store? You're just relying on me, the customer, to remember what went on, to remember to go to your website in three days time, to remember what I was looking at and try to find it on your website um, and hope that I convert. You're putting a lot on the customer. Um, so what this gets back to is, you know, this is basically what our, our agency focuses most of our energy on is how do we get it so that whenever the customer is doing one of these two things, um, they are focused and connected to our brand. Um, do you have an account with us? Should be the first question that when you ask, not when you're standing at the polls, but when you walk in the store. Um, if you have an account with us, um, let's look at the history of that account. If I can see that you were viewing these things online, um, would you like to try them on? Um, I can see that you really like this top, but you don't want to buy it today. Would you like me to add it to your wish list so that when you get home, it's there waiting for you? Um, is there an auto wish list email that fires off like an abandoned card email? Yes, of course there should be. Um, but that should just be a result of a customer experience strategy as opposed to a digital strategy or an email marketing strategy. That should just be the mechanism we use to deliver the experience that the customer wants. I'm spending time with you. Send me a receipt of what got done and how I as a customer can pick up where I left off. And after a while, this brand is always assisting me through my discovery transact and delivery process ongoing. These other brands make me work for it. I have to keep working for it. I have to keep telling them who I am. What's your name again? Here I am again. Um, what are you interested in? What's your size? I don't know. I bought from you three times. You should know my size. Why don't you know my size? Um, really basic things that you'd think um, in this day and age would happen. But the reason it doesn't happen is because of this separation. Um, Sorry, yeah. uh, just a quick question. Yeah. Um, so Danny, that sounds interesting because in a, say, a B2B environment, um, a salesperson would record all those interactions in their CRM. Yes. So they're actually doing a better job of capturing that customer's preferences for the point in time when they want to actually make a purchase. Yeah, I think you'll find in, in B2C, um, B2C or direct to consumer that a lot of terms like CRM are thrown around. I think CRM, as a concept is something that services the salesperson that's designed for the, the sales agent. Um, CRM when it's applied in, in retail or direct to consumer um, morphed into something that became a marketing tool um, and then marketing concepts started flying back towards B2B. And I think there's a bit of a blurred line between marketing technology, CRM, um, customer data platforms. There's a, there's a bit of a blurry line and I think it'd be, it'd be quite hard as a brand um, or a business to navigate, well, what am I asking for? Am I asking for a CRM? Um, is this what this is or is this something else? So yeah, definitely. I think the, there's no sort of right or wrong answer here, but the, the only thing I'd be advocating for is to make sure that when you use the, the tools or technology, whether it's called a CRM or whether it's called a CDP or a marketing automation tool, is that if it's about focusing on what does it give to the customer and the people that serve them. Um, there's one other line that we've used in the past, which is how would you describe your staff, your frontline staff, whether they be your sales reps or whether they be um, a shop front owner or a customer service agent. Um, most brands see those staff as clear representatives of our brand that have limited access to some customers. That's the way those frontline staff are thought about and you know, talked about. Um, we like to think of them as um, the, the frontline staff as representatives of your customers that have great access to the brand. And when I say access to the brand, they have access to tools, to data, um, to stock, to the ability to take payments, to the ability to get um, to turn up in a ute and drop some stuff off at the front end of the factory. Um, so I see them as agents of the customer. And you know, back here we talked about here inside of these all these channels, you've got all these people and all these staff or representatives that work for you. Um, again, if you spend all your strategy trying to work out how they can best represent you to the customer, as opposed to how can, how can we give these guys access to the customer and 
first and represent them to the brand instead, the brand that owns the products. Um, it seems like a subtle difference, but we find that the more you think about this, the more empathy you have for the customer's jobs, the more you see your frontline staff or sales reps as representatives of a customer, and you need to solve for their needs as opposed to your needs. Um, the same problem that you're trying to solve might be able to be unlocked in different ways. Um, another example that explains that the difference between a CRM maybe and a CDP um, is that um, if you compare maybe fly, do you have flybys over in, in New Zealand as well? Cold, maybe not, I'm not sure. So if you have kind of like a, um, a, a supermarket loyalty program and you get points, so typically you'll go in there and you'll buy eggs and milk and you'll scan your card and it goes, thanks, here's 50 points for doing that or 20 points. The points have some value and that's why you keep doing it. Um, but at any time, if you want to go, well, I wonder how many pints of milk I buy in a year or how many eggs I bought in a year, the, the program would say, well, that's, quite, that's, a, that's a privacy request. And yes, we have, we're obligated to do that by law, but this data isn't for you. We gave you your points. The data's for us, the brands, for our marketing weaponry. Um, and a CRM is kind of the same. That data is for us. It's for yeah, that, that, that thing you liked, that phone call we had. That's for me to see. It's not for you, the customer, to see. Um, so we sort of turn that around on its head. Um, there's another example I use, which is Strava, which is a, a running app um, or a riding app. Um, you jump on your bike, you press start, and you go for a ride. And then at the end of the ride, you get this beautiful detailed map of where you rode and how fast you went and the, the stats of, um, you know, compared to other people even. Um, it's really interesting and you, you, you do it over and over again. And if you ever go for a ride and forget to press start, it's really you know, quite disappointing because now that didn't happen as far as the app's concerned. Now, if that app turned around and said, do your ride, press start, press stop, and at the end of the ride said, thanks very much, um, we've got that data, here's five points, but you couldn't see any of that data. You'd be, no one would use that app. No one would use that app because Maybe if they gave you $10 to do it instead, like, like Flywise or all these points programs do, they do give you some, some money back to give us the data. Um, but what Strava has seen is that the, the data itself is valuable to the person who created it. So we're saying the same thing in, in, in B2B or B2C. Think about if that history that you're using is so valuable, maybe it's valuable to the customer too. Maybe if they could have a history of what we said last time so that might remind me to talk to you again. If I could see the things that I viewed online, the things that I tried on install, the things that I liked or didn't like, my preferences. You know, I'm, a, I'm a, a plumbing supplies customer and I love Bosch and Ream, but I don't like a few other uh, brands. Um, so they're my preferences. So don't sell me stuff that's coming from um, you know, brand X because I only, I'm loyal to brand Y and Z that you stock. Um, so let me see that. I know it might be in your CRM, but why can't it be in my customer account um, is the point that we're trying to make. Um, so all this gets down to the idea that you need, you need a customer database. You need a customer database, hopefully, to be something that the customer can access um, and is a willing participant in. And every time we do anything, transact or interact, that, that is recorded for the sake of the customer first, the people that serve them second, and then the business third. If you follow that, Mechanization, then you, you can generally do pretty well. Um, if you only say, well, let's track all the data for the sake of marketing, so marketing can solve its problems, like pushing a new product or moving some stock that's not moving, um, it's, it'll work to a degree, but you're going to find it harder and harder to get the customers to stay engaged and to choose to log in, to choose to say, yes, I have an account when I walk in. So there needs to be reasons to do it. So you end up getting in the loyalty program design territory saying, why would I always say who I am when I walk in the door? Or why would I always log into the website when I'm browsing, not just when I'm checking out? They're the sorts of um, you know, fundamental strategic questions you need to solve. Because if you can get that true, um, and we've done this with brands that had 0% of sales in store going through against the counts, up to 95% of sales in store going against the counts. Um, and that's, you know, that's a huge difference. And all of a sudden that data that is so valuable to everything, everyone else that's tracking it is now valuable to you. Um, and it's an asset. In the old days, it used to be called goodwill on your balance sheet, but now you can, you can actually quantify that for every known customer, on average a year they spend this amount of money, Therefore, every new known customer we generate, will be putting that in the bank for this year and the next 10 years afterwards. Um, when you look at subscription model businesses, 
um, their annual recurring revenue is everything. They live and die by the number of active users they've got, which means active shopping customers and the annual recurring revenue. That's how businesses that are being valued in the millions and billions are being judged, not just on their basic profit or EBIT. They're being, they're being judged on their future potential um, and that sort of cumulative growth that comes from creating engaged customers. If you look at Ubers or uh, Amazons or anything else, there is no guest checkout. There is no option to be an unknown person in those platforms. Uber, you must download the app, put your credit card details in, put all your details in. You must log in every time. You must tell it exactly where you are on the planet at all times. Like it's pretty crazy. Um, yet the convenience you get from just jumping in and jumping out is amazing. And that convenience that comes from being a known customer, being able to pick up where you left off, you know, where are you going at 5 a.m. in the morning? You're probably going to the airport. Yep, I am. And it knows that because why shouldn't it know that? Um, so those, those concepts are, um, are really important. Um, I'm just checking my notes here to see what else we want to cover. Um, so I think a lot of those principles transcend B2B and B2C. I think if there's anything specific that's coming up, um, you can start adding your questions into the Q&A um, as we go. Um, but when it comes to brand, brand experience, marketing um, and customer experience, what are the difference between these things? Um, you've probably got the, the theme of it by now that this idea that the brand, if the brand is the way you present your products and choose to be in market through channels um, and the brand experience is the sum of these things, um, customer experience is really just the same thing, but from their point of view. I think brand experience and customer experience is the same thing, just from a different perspective. Um, so I think the, making sure the only thing you need to do to have a successful customer experience strategy, if your brand experience is already something you've probably spent years or decades crafting is just to change your point of view. And this is what we're seeing now, the rise of, in bigger businesses, the rise of now having a CXO, someone in the business who is in charge of um, representing the customer's point of view um, at the big table. Um, these people might be born out of um, frontline retail staff or customer service staff or um, the head of the sales teams, anyone that's actually been on the front lines. They're the ones that will actually come in and uh, start taking these sorts of roles. Um, CEOs traditionally would be the ones that would represent the customer in market. Um, publicly listed customers, it starts becoming more about shareholders and less about customers. Um, but obviously that's that's the main, the main game here. Um, when it comes to, um, so once you've set your CX strategy, um, you understand how that relates and equates to your brand experience you're trying to do. You end up by mapping all these experiences you want, you can start working out what the gaps are in your experiences and go, well, my website doesn't provide what my customers want. Um, my in-store experience is lacking. There is no connection between the two. My email marketing is really more about me and less about them. You'll start sort of seeing the gaps fairly quickly. Um, my customer service takes too long. My deliveries are too long. When people are expecting more. Um, you'll then start getting a, a bit of a list of initiatives that you, you can sort of prove that would be valuable to your customers. Um, once you can describe what those initiatives are and what if we fix that, we'd make those problems go away. Um, then you just need to go, well, does my existing tech, can it do that? Does my existing tech, my existing digital agency, my existing backyard internet guy or girl, can they go in and do the work that will make that experience better than what it is today? And there's always something to do. There's a hundred things to do. The worst thing you could be doing is spending a lot of time trying to work out what the hundred things are without doing the first one. While you're trying to decide what item 20, 21, 22 is, make sure you're doing item one. It should be easy to identify what item one is right now. Start doing it now. You need to be making progress all the time on this because customer expectations of what they want from the brands they love is moving all the time. So this all sounds overwhelming. Um, there's a, another concept that we talk about, which is about the, the, distrib the sort of non-linear distribution of the value of customers. Um, so I'll draw another little picture. So these are all your customers. Um, so right now, we're getting back to a point now where all your customers, these ones I'm describing as customers you know. So you fixed all the other problems. We now, customers who visit our experiences are known to us, most of them. Um, you might have a portion of customers sort of above or outside this block that are unknown to us, but let's just put them to one side. Hopefully it's less than half. Um, so inside this customer group, um, and let's say, 
if you're the sort of brand that sells things to a person who would logically buy from you at least once or twice a year, um, it's not like a, a bed who you might only shop once every 10 years or maybe car tires, um, then we'll say that active means that you've shopped in the last year. So inside these people that have shopped in the last year, a portion of these people will be new, which means they've just, they've just become known to you. Uh, they might have shopped for 10 years, but this was the year they decided to say, yep, my name is Danny Phillips, please. Yeah. Don't add me to your database. Don't use words like database or loyalty program or subscribe or newsletter. You should never use those words. Do you have an account? Let me create an account for you. There's a, there's a lot of reasons why having an account is good. So they're your new customers. Um, then in the middle of all of this, you've got your, um, all your active customers. Now, when it comes to the revenue these people generate in a year, um, things get pretty interesting. We split it down the middle. So we've got um, your bottom 50%. I should put the bottom on the bottom, shouldn't I? Bottom 50% um, and your top 50%. Um, so, but inside the top 50%, I'm just going to put another line here and make that 40 and make this 10%. So what we're looking at here is the fact that there's 10% of your customers. Now let's say this is, again, a 1,000 a, um, a customers. Um, so you're going to have 100, 400, and 500 customers um, in these buckets. Now, so this is by count. So generally when you open a store, open a website, you know that if any one of these people walks in the door, the lights have to turn on, the door has to open. Um, all of them equally get your effort. You, you, know, you have to wait in line behind me because I'm serving this customer now and then I'll, I'll get to you once I've got to, through this person. Equal effort to all people. The problem is though that the, the value that these people generate isn't proportional. If I went over to here and drew a picture of, this is all the money we got from these people. This is all the money in the bank this year from all of these people. Um, the reason I put you over in a little bucket over here is because we don't yet know really where they're gonna fall over the course of the year. Um, what we find is the top 10% generate almost half. So up to, let's just say 40% of the revenue comes from this group of people. This group of people make the next 50%, which is a lot. And then as little as 10% come from this group. Half of your customers generate probably 10% of your revenue. Some industries or brands or setups might be different to this, um, but we find that most, most brands that sell regularly to a similar group of customers who shop all the once a year, that this is the truth. So when it comes to my effort, when it comes to choosing how I'm gonna play out my strategy, where I'm gonna invest my time and energy and platforms and vendors and all that sort of stuff. The trap is, or even my advertising, if I go and type, if I pay for, if my brand name was called Bob's Burgers and I bid on Google for anyone who's searching for Bob's Burgers, which is you know, a silly strategy in its own right, but people still do it, um, then I'll probably equally get people from that and I'll be spending $10 on these people, $40 on these people, and $50 on these people because they're all going to be searching roughly the same. But the return I'll get is different. So wouldn't it be better if I spent all my $100 or $1,000 on just these people? Why bother with these people? Um, that's the sort of fundamental thing. And when you think about the value of these customers, generally what your position when you're looking at these people is you're sort of standing here looking at this whole group Whereas what we want to do is stand here and just look at these people. Well, that's, that should be your point of view. You should be standing here looking at your new customers because they're, your, they're the people that, for whatever crazy reason, have decided to be, become known to you today. Mm -hmm. They've told you, yes, my name is Danny Phillips. I like your brand. Let's talk. You've only got one shot at a first impression, so you need to spend time here. Um, and then the 10%. And then as you get down into here, less and less is your attention. And literally, we open the doors for these people and that's about it because they just don't generate you the money that you need to justify it. Um, and at the moment, you're getting, you're probably giving 50% of your effort to these people, which is a waste of resources and a waste of time. Um, by shifting things around and saying, well, these people want these experiences, these people want click and collect, these people want um, buy now, pay later services, they want to buy things on accounts, they want free returns because um, they will, even though 
in a transaction, a, a return might feel like it costs you money. When you add up the amount they spend in the year, they are the top 10% of your customers. This is what the maths determines. They're generating 40% of the revenue. You can afford to give these people free returns. You can't afford to give these people free returns. So they shouldn't have it. So that's why you know, things like tiered loyalty programs come in. It's not a marketing exercise. It's a way to focus the benefits on customers that deserve it. That's it. So, and preventing giving um, customers that don't deserve it more. Now, some would argue that you could just go, well, this is great. Why don't we just make all of these people become these people? Just move them all up the chain. Um, in my experience, that doesn't work. It doesn't happen. People that are, you might be able to, again, like this world here, you might be able to get people that are on the edges to move and shift people up a little bit. And if you can move your whole cohort of people, you know, 1%, upwards, that's a huge amount of money too. So don't get me wrong, that's shifting people sideways, but don't try to make this person become this person. Try to make this person become this person. Try to make every customer shop a little bit more often. Um, one of the ROI calculations that we've done is um, what if I could make X people shop one extra time a year through all of the experiences I've pulled together, all the things that we've just discussed. So from an ROI point of view, um, if you say uh, we have, again, you know, 10,000 customers that are shop with us over the course of the year, what if I could make a, maybe one in five of those, and hopefully the one in five that are part of this, um, so 20% shop one extra time a year, let's say we've got a $100 ATV and we can make one in five or 20%, so in this case it would be 2,000 people, 2,000 people shop one extra time a year because that wish list that you did in store went home or because of the way you communicated with them or because it was more convenient to shop with you because you offered click and collect. Um, then you know, times that by 100 and there you've got your um, $200,000. Now, that's the opportunity. So your CX investment, if you want to, let's say a three to one payback over a year or a 10 to one payback over a year, let's say you want 10 to one payback, then you've got um, $20,000 to spend on your CX initiatives. Now, if you only spend 20,000, getting one in, one in five to, to buy that extra time might be a bit of a stretch. Um, so that's where you'll work with your, your strategic partners to work out an ROI model that works. With ROI, um, uh, the thing too is that there's, there's two versions of ROI. There's return on investment, which is you know, very obvious to everyone, but there's also risk of inaction, um, which is an often forgotten ROI measure. Once you know something, once you know something could give you value, and once you've done the calculations that that thing could give me $20,000 a month in incremental revenue, you then need to put that into your ROI calculations that for every month you don't do that you are going backwards by 20,000. So, you know, ignorance is bliss, but once you know an initiative could generate return, you then need to start banking every month, the month you don't do it, because that's now your risk of inaction. Um, sometimes risk of inaction calculations can really justify bringing spend forward and doing things more than any return on investment. Um, just because of the, the, the mere act of delaying this investment is, it hurts. It can actually hurt your bottom line. You can see it in brands that are spending a lot of time trying to decide what to do. We go, we're not quite ready. Our foundations aren't quite right. We just need to wait for this other event to happen. I need to wait until we open this store or open this channel or move to a new country. All these little reasons why doing something just might have to wait a little bit. Um, but every month that happens where you're waiting to do something, you're getting further and further behind the expectations of consumers. Unfortunately, consumers are out there enjoying new things all the time, like the Uber example. Um, and everyone, everyone who's not in the um, getting people from A to Z industry might be saying things like, well, I don't need to worry about Uber because I don't transport people. But what's happening is I go to a cafe now and go, man, waiting in line is, I'm bored. I don't want to wait in line for five people deep to buy a coffee. Or maybe I've gone and sat down and bought breakfast and now I have to get up and pay and now I have to stand up behind all the coffee people. People are going, oh, but I, just, I caught an Uber here. That works really well. Why can't I just Uber this whole cafe experience? And sure enough, there's startups popping up now where you can you know, have an Uber experience at a cafe. You order at the table, you pay, you leave. You don't have to go and stand at the polls. Um, 
you think about a retail experience, if I am on my website on the phone, or on your website on the phone, I go and check out, I buy the thing I like, and I click and collect, and then I walk into store. The store's assuming that you're definitely not in the store because why would you do that? But if I'm standing in a store, um, and I've done this with Uber Eats, by the way, if I'm, there's an ice cream shop in Ligo Street that's always got queues out the door, um, I sat in front of it on the tables in my family, did an Uber Eats order from that ice cream place to their address. The guy turns up on the bike, does the delivery to me out the front. It was quicker than the people that were serving because those guys get to cut the queue. Um, and that's a whole other story. That's not right that that happens. Um, but yeah, cafes are doing this, other industries are doing this. But if I click and collect, if I was standing in store while there was a queue of people waiting for the pause, I could make my purchase, go through the whole thing and show the person that I've actually paid for it. Can I just take the goods now? So even the concept of what is a point of sale is, a, is about to radically change once customers realize that I've actually got one in my pocket. It's probably a better computer than what's sitting behind the counter anyway. Mm -hmm. Half the time people are complaining that their POS software is out of date, but I've got a mobile phone in my pocket that's probably you know, faster than 10 of your POS platforms put together. Um, five minutes. Five minutes, okay. Um, so what else do I want to cover? So I think outside of that, um, we've talked about the value of the customers. We've talked about the value of each channel and the role it plays. Um, I've talked a little bit about being careful of outsourcing your customer data and your customer experiences, um, using buy now, pay later services, using third party ordering systems, using um, uh, even just using advertising tracking pixel on your website. Every time you do these things, you're giving away part of your customer experience or part of your customer data to someone else. That someone else might provide a good or a service in return to you, but they're also probably providing that data to others as well. So all I'm asking brands to really think about is, you know, there is a lot, a lot of inherent value in the transaction and interaction data I'm generating. If only I made it my priority to make sure that we captured it. When we capture it, it can feel a bit um, sort of murky because I'm, I'm siphoning all this customer data into my CRM, into my marketing weaponry. If you can turn that around and say, oh, it's not for us, it's for them, it's for their convenience and for the agents that serve them's convenience. By doing that, you can take the moral high ground again because this is not for us, it's for you, the customer. Um, if you don't want to participate, if you just want to be a just browsing casual guest, then that's fine. But every single day, whether they're 90 year old customers or nine year old customers, every single day people are realizing that there is more to be gained in sharing my information with the brands that I trust and I like. These people will do it. I don't really care too much. If you say half of my customers won't do this, that's probably this half, they don't matter. Um, we had a brand that we worked with that installed, they had an app as well as their e-commerce strategy. Um, the CEO asked the question, how many of our customers use the app? And we said 15%. We go, well, that's, that's a bit of a disappointment. I would have expected that to be more. So this is a, a brand. That people will say the brand apps work. So you answer that question, you go, well, no, sorry, the, the app isn't working. We should, maybe we should stop investing in it. So then I reposed the question, said, well, the, how many of these customers use the app? And it was 80%. So when we, did, when we looked at the 15%, it wasn't 15% equally across this. The 15% were all up here. There's a few little people down here, but not many. So the people who cared enough about the brand that generated 40% of that revenue were coming from these app users. So I'm not saying the app made them better customers. The app was for better customers. These experiences are for your best customers. Um, focus on the best and spend less time on the rest. This is the noisy majority. Um, these are the people that will make a difference. In my, so my opinion here is if you spent every single cent that you had spared on changing the way you operated your business to serve these people, I would argue that these people define your brand in a lot of ways, just as much as you probably define them. They love your brand so much that they, you know, they probably wear branded t-shirts, like put a tattoo on their arm if they wanted to. It'd be crazy, but it's like the one percent. Um, once you start defining each other in terms of like that, then what happens is advocacy. So you might find that if you can retain your best customers, this is all about retention. 
Um, acquisition might happen because these people, this is getting a bit scribbly now, these people will be the people that find these people. These people who you are giving you know, super great service to won't advocate for you, which means they won't tell their other bargain hunting friends that this is the brand for you. So more of these people will be flowing into here as opposed to into there. And that's that's the game. And if, if you could do that well enough, my theory is, and um, haven't seen this yet in practice, is that, that lo the loyalty and advocacy would be organic and genuine. And that would generate new incremental revenue that offsets any churn you might have of people becoming inactive um, and become a positive feedback loop um, in your own platform. Um, so that's, you know, in a nutshell, that's, I, I know I talked a lot about customer relationship and customer experience, and I'm hoping you could see that in amongst all of this, digital tools play a whole real purpose in that, but I think unless you can articulate your strategy clearly to your vendors and your technology providers um, or your agencies, they will try to sell you the features of the tool. They just need to, they need to bring the features to bear on your strategy. And they'll be really good at that. If you can articulate your stuff clearly, the agencies will um, in return uh, fire back really good solutions. Um, so thanks, I think we'll kind of answer some questions. Yeah. Yes, um, thanks very much, Danny. Yes, we'll, cut, we'll go to questions now. Um, just before we do that, though, I thought I'd maybe pull out some key points that I took from what you've gone through. I think the major one for me really is this starting from the customer's point of view and solving for their needs, um, and, and that's what customer experience is all about. And that really forms the foundation of a, a strategy as we move more into this digital commerce um, world with, with our customers. So, and secondly, that um, by taking that point of view, we can then more easily understand that there's an interaction between online and offline. Yes. And they work together to, to um, drive that, um, that, that uh, relationship between the brand and, and uh, its customer. Yes. So, and then from there, as we understand that, we can then really refocus on making the most of these interactions. Yes. And that... By, by focusing here, once we know what the customer wants, we can start collecting information to better understand and deliver to their needs. So by looking at it as capturing this information to help them yes. achieve what they want to achieve. Rather than help us market to them. That's right. It's a good byproduct, but yes. them first, us second. Yes, that's right. And then a couple of other uh, points I took um, were quite important, I thought were quite important, is that these interactions then require us to, to, to enable our team members to get closer um, and understand our customers better. So providing that that additional access that you talked about. Yeah, tools and techniques. Tools so, and techniques. Yeah, so yeah. the technology starts flowing in at that point, but it's also mm -hmm. techniques and scripts and culture and you know, policies yes. and all those sorts of things. So yes. it transcends technology. To so ultimately that helps when we're thinking about our strategy if we start with those key points and keep coming back to those key points then what happens in an operational sense actually starts becoming easier to pick out yeah. so we start to be able to pick out how our communications might not be a hitting the mark or how we need to improve our delivery services and how we need to enable our customer service. So and it gives your team buy-in too. When, mm. when teams are given a whole stack of new technology to use, it just mm. makes their job harder. Yes. When you're saying, here's some you know, processes and, and tools that we're using for our customers, mm. um, which makes you a better frontline staff member, then mm. the, the reason behind change becomes Mm. a bit more appealing to them as opposed to just learning another tool. That's right, yeah. yeah. So, um, so uh, from there, I think, you know, we, we obviously um, move to focusing on the best yep. um, because they define a brand yes. rather than the rest, as you said. Yep. So, Don't lock um, the doors on them, but, no. but, but a disproportionate amount of mm. effort needs to be spent yeah. on the top. So by taking this, going back to the beginning, it's almost circular yep. because we're able to better know our most valuable customers. Yes. So, so I think um, ultimately to me, uh, good strategy in this area starts with that consumer point of view. Yes. And if we can all change our points of view away from our product, which we know is good, we know is fantastic, we know is high quality, um, but changing to our customer, 
then we start to be able to build the foundations of a really great strategy. So um, we might just uh, go to a few questions now. Sure. And um, while I look up some of the... I'll go on this one that's come through earlier. The one that came through earlier. Okay, so one that came through um, a bit earlier was uh, we hear about tech debt, um, technical debt. What, what's your view on building for right now versus what we might need in three to five years? Um, as a digital agency, you know, we've been uh, responsible for helping fix technical debt, but also causing a lot of it as well. Um, I think the nature of technology these days is that things are changing quite fast. You should be building a, a lot of your things to be reasonably disposable um, because that will allow um, more customers or you to try more things, um, work out what's working and what's not, and you might be able to shift and move platforms and technology quite quickly. Um, at the end of the day, unless you're selling or providing a service where people might live or die based on what you put out there, then often you can step back from trying to make things that are super, super robust and deal with any edge cases or problems in market rather than trying to spend a whole lot of money making the ultimate perfect thing. The thing you design in February, but don't launch until November, is probably already out of date. So no project, no initiative should be longer than two to three months. Whatever you're planning to build today should be in market in three months at the absolute minimum. Um, anything that's gonna take longer than that is too big a project, you should do something smaller. Um, because where you are in three, six, nine months time will be not where you thought you'd be. Um, unless you spend a whole lot of money deciding that what you wanna do is exactly this thing, um, then when you get there and the agency says, we built you exactly what you wanted, but it's not what you need anymore, um, but everyone was so hell bent on sticking to the scope, um, then you'll, you'll find those problems. Um, so yeah. Thanks, um, thanks, Danny. We've got another question here from Helene. Uh, how important is live chat in converting customers online? Um, yeah, live chat. Um, I think if a customer is online, especially if you're in certain categories, I know for a fact that in retail, um, that most purchase decisions online happen between you know, 7 p.m. and 11 p.m. at night. Um, while people are second screening on their phone, live chat would, can make all the difference. We, we see that the conversion rate on live chat sessions is usually around 15, 16, up to 20% compared to one or 2%. Now, did the live chat cause the transaction or did people who are likely to transact need live chat? Um, I think once you, it's easy to turn on, there's heaps of very good tools that are available. Turn it on, dedicate some hours at the time when your conversions happen the most prove that they um, generate their own income and then scale accordingly. Um, so I'd say live chat is very important, but what is probably more important is the ability to answer questions quickly. Um, so if you were using a platform, say like Zendesk, um, rather than focusing on the live chat side, I'd focus on what's called Guide, which is their um, self-service FAQ section. If your FAQ section is amazing and spend a lot of time on it, most people won't need to get to live chat because they got the answer. Customers don't want live chat, they just want answers and they need them right now. If that's not on your website, then the live chat's the next best, quickest way to get an answer to my question right now. Email, I have to wait till tomorrow, phone call, you know, after being a queue. So live chat just works for customers who want answers right now, but you could solve that with proactive FAQs. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, another one from Nikki. Uh, is there any software that integrates in-store data across to the brand so stores and brands can work together with the same information from the customer? Yep, so um, if, they're, if you're dealing with, um, if you're dealing as a wholesaler and you're arm's length away from the customer, I think things get a little bit trickier. Um, you really have to put the software on the customer's hands and let them take responsibility for tracking what they purchase. If you own the stores though, and you're vertically integrated, um, then definitely yes. Um, uh, our product, Shameless Plug is one of them, Omneo, O-M-N-E-O dot I-O, um, is exactly that, it, it links together the online account with the in-store account with the email marketing account. There is only one version of Danny Phillips and that's this guy. Um, so what he looks at online, what he decides to do in-store is all linked and made available. And we link into the e-commerce platform, which is just an online POS and a catalogue. The in-store POS, it's just supposed to be there to do sales. It's not there to deal with customers. Um, so yeah, that's there are a few out there. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Okay, uh, I think that's all I've got online. Um, and we've got only a couple of minutes left. So 
um, one of the others that came in earlier is that if we had limited digital resources and we're now trying to support multiple geographies from New Zealand, how would you optimise the customer experience in a localised way in the key offshore markets? Yeah. So, Look, I think um, it's all about this sort of discovery thing. So having having people on the ground available for things like live chat is a really good first step. Um, you've got the advantage that you're in you're slightly um, ahead of us in time in some way, so you can catch the early part of the day. Um, but it's a bit worse for that seven to eleven at night because you're <laughs> at one a.m. in the morning at that point. Um, uh, things like pop-ups and physical campaigns. I think the good thing that's happening. I'm mean, back in retail now, but there's a lot of pressure on centres to create new experiences. And there's a lot of um, stores that are closing. There's lots of physical space available. Um, so trying to take advantage, just like you would in the advertising day of a distress rate for a, um, a media campaign, look for opportunities to do pop-ups where you can bring the brand experience. You don't need to hold a lot of stock because that's what your website's for. Um, showing things in local currencies always helps. So maybe we'll do maths. Um, and just you know, make them feel comfortable that the, the shipping and, and returns will all be easy and there's no problems, mm -hmm. you know, just showing that you're present in the country. Mm -hmm. I've seen a lot of just little pop-ups that, that will show on the site as soon as you hit it from outside of your home site saying, looks like you're coming from Australia, that's not a problem. We'll show it in prices, our deliveries are quick, same returns as everyone else. It just makes them know that, oh, cool, you know how to trade with Australia. That's enough for me to look around your New Zealand site and still feel comfortable. Um, so, yeah, I think that's... Just be explicit to your Australian or other country audience that, that you know that that's where you are and that we will serve you well there, even if you don't have a physical presence. Mm. But, you know, physical and online, you know, it's very, we've had brands come to Australia. Um, Top Shop's a good example, came to Australia, opened lots of physical stores, but didn't bring the e-commerce over as well. Um, and not realising that all of that people that were here going to offline we're getting a consistent experience because they were seeing Northern Hemisphere stock. Um, at least we're in the same hemisphere, so it's a bit easier. Mm -hmm. um, just make sure you balance both.